Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Today, we are going to be talking genomics and specifically for commercial producers. So I'm going to be bringing on Nick Hammett, and he is with Neogen, and we're going to be talking about the Identity Beef Program and how commercial cow-calf producers can incorporate genomic testing into their operation, how you can use that to see an ROI, what it really can look like in your own current production system, as well as how you can use that information to better your relationship with your seed stock providers, improve your bowl selection, et cetera. There's a lot we talk about. There's a lot we cover in a short amount of time. It's a great interview. It's a quick interview. And we are going to jump right to that. But quickly, I do want to remind you that if you are interested in finding a program that connects you to different ranchers from around the country and industry experts on a regular basis to help you answer any questions you may have, whether it's about business management, risk management, family transitions, we really cover a variety of topics. I'd encourage you to go to the show notes and check out the Rancher Mind program. I do have a few slots open yet for the upcoming quarters if you are interested in joining us. So go check that out. But with that, let's visit with Nick. All right, Nick. Well, thank you for joining me here today. And we are going to have a conversation about genomic testing in the beef industry for seed stock and commercial producers. We're going to talk specifically kind of on the commercial side today, but we're going to cover a lot of ground in this conversation. So I, again, I just appreciate you being on here today and being willing to have this conversation with me. I know we've had the opportunity to visit on the phone a couple of times, but to give the audience out there and all those listeners an idea of who you are and your background in the beef industry and what you do today, can you kind of introduce yourself a little bit so everyone knows who they're talking to or listening to, I guess I'm talking to. Sure. Appreciate you having me, Shay. Uh, Nick Hammett, uh, coming to you live from central Missouri. Grew up here in Missouri, did my undergrad in Missouri, went out to Colorado State, got a master's, spent a few years out in Colorado, worked for a couple of breed associations, a vertically integrated beef company, a large commercial cow-calf operation up in the mountains, but spent the majority of my career working here in Missouri for a really large uh, seed stock and commercial operation, ran about 8,000 cows. My primary job was marketing the bulls, buying the calves back for the feedlot, marketing the fat cattle out of the feedlot. So spent the majority of my career doing what a lot of your customers and listeners actually do. And uh, about three years ago, went to work for Neogen as a territory manager in central United States, then became a regional manager in the western half of the U.S. And currently, I'm a key accounts manager, which means I handle the largest commercial beef and dairy accounts across the United States. Well, you have a very extensive background, it sounds like, and a lot of hands-on experience, which is it's always fun to listen to people or visit with people who have all those unique experiences because they can tie so many bits and pieces of the industry together when we look at it as a whole system. So really right off the bat, Nick, I know um, for my loyal listeners, they've heard me talk about genomic testing before with various individuals, but for maybe someone who's new to either the beef industry, because I know I have some first generation producers who listen or someone who's just new to the show. Can you kind of just talk about what is genomic testing? Because it's so easy, you know, we hear genomics and we think seed stock, but what is genomic testing on a basic level for any producer? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of times when I'm trying to relate it to my non-ag friends, I talk about relating it to 23andMe, and they can kind of understand that concept. You know, we're sending in a genomic sample, in our case, typically an ear punch TSU sample, and from that, we're running a genomic background. So we're looking at SNPs, which are, not to get too scientific, but single nucleotide polymorphism. So small changes in the genomic profile, and we have a database of phenotypes, which are weights and measures, and genotypes types, and we know how those correlate to one another. So basically, we're looking at your animal's genome, and we're saying we know these are the genes that animal has, and this is the production characteristics related to the genetic profile of that animal. And we do that at both the seed stock and the commercial level. Okay, so how are genomics currently being used in the beef industry today? 
So I think most of us think of them being used at a seed stock level. A lot of us, when we're buying bulls, we understand the concept of genomically enhanced EPDs, or we at least understand that maybe the person we're buying bulls from is doing some form of genomic testing. And they're doing that basically to improve the accuracy of those EPDs for both themselves and for their commercial customers. So they'll send in a sample. It'll typically go through their breed association. They'll get back genomic data to the breed association and they'll make those EPDs more accurate. So when a commercial man goes to the seed stock guy and he's buying a Cavanese bull, he can rest more assuredly that that is actually going to prove out to be a Cavanese bull or a high growth bull or a high marbling bull. So I think that's how most of us typically understand the use of genomics in the cattle industry today. Uh, but it's also being used a lot at just the commercial level by not just large operations, but operations of all size who want to make better selection, management, breeding, and mating decisions. So how does that kind of work on the commercial level? Because seed stock producers are constantly collecting data, whether that's doing genomically enhanced EPDs, taking a lot of phenotypic measurements. What does that really look like on the commercial side? How does that work? And I think that's maybe one of the biggest value of genomics in that you don't have to be a seed stock operator. You don't have to maintain pedigrees. You don't have to collect birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, carcass data. And all that is really time consuming, labor intensive, uh, can be fairly expensive. So the benefit of genomics is that you can get about 80% of the value of a genomically enhanced EPD with just genomic testing. So you're not doing all the work and labor associated with what a seed stock operator might be doing. So a commercial operator of any size can send in their sample and get back genomically enhanced uh, scores. I mean, they're not necessarily EPDs because we're not incorporating pedigrees and phenotypic data, but you're going to get genomic scores to make management selection, mating, breeding decisions just based on that genomic sample alone. All right. And we will dive more into those genomic scores and what Igenity Beef is a little later in the conversation, but I still kind of want to talk a little bit about kind of that gap between genomics with the seed stock producer and the commercial producer. So with the commercial guys, is it primarily to figure out, you know, what's going to be the best replacement heifer, where they can take their herd? Is it, um, how is this data being used? Is it being used for marketing? Like what are kind of all the avenues where they are finding value in it? A little bit of both. I mean, typically what I think the most bang for your buck and the best starting point is testing your potential replacement females. So when you're making that selection decision, which females am I going to keep back and put into my herd? You want to make the right decision there because they're going to be cows in your herd, hopefully for a long time, or we want to figure out which ones maybe aren't going to last a long time. So that's what it helps us do with the most return on your investment, I think, is making those replacement heifer decisions. But you can also use either that data to qualify your steers and to characterize your steers that you'll be marketing, or we have some other tests like a feeder test where you can characterize those feeder steers or feeder heifers that you're selling to help add value to those animals and say, you know, I'm not just saying these animals are good animals because I spent money on bulls from so-and-so. It actually genetically proves the genomic value of those animals from a feedlot perspective, from a carcass perspective. So those potential buyers have more reliability when they're buying your calves and they're willing to pay you more money for their cattle because they know more about the genomics that they're actually buying. Absolutely. And so do you think that's really more the direction the industry is going in the next 10 to 20 years as far as buyers wanting more genomic information or at least more data on cattle in general? I do. So from both the buyer's and seller's perspective. So from the buyer's perspective, there's continuously more risk involved in purchasing calves. Calves are expensive. Feed is expensive. You see a lot of supply chains vertically aligning to where they want to hit a specific target in terms of their product at the end of the marketing chain. So 
By having that genomic information, it lessens the buyer's risk because they know they're going to gain better. They can manage them more accordingly and group them into outcome groups. And they can manage their supply chain better, knowing when those calves are going to come out and exactly what kind of product they're going to be producing. So they can hit those very targeted supply chain needs. So I think from a buyer's perspective, yeah, they want to reduce risk as much as possible. From a seller's perspective, for a lot of these folks, genomic testing is not an expense that you just definitely must have in order to produce cattle. You must feed them. You must vaccinate them mostly. There's some things you have to do. Obviously, genomic testing is not one of those, so it's typically not in your budget or not an expense you're currently incurring. And right now, input costs are extremely high in every facet, feed, fuel, fertilizer, you name it, it costs a lot to maintain a cow. So genomic expense appears to be another additional cost that we're adding on to that. But with those high input costs, we have to figure out how to be as efficient as possible. So how do we select the right females? How do we make the right mating decisions so that we can drive down those feed costs and those input costs? And I think genomics are a key to doing that. If you look at uh, variable rate application in farming today, Many large farmers, they don't farm without it. They understand that it makes sense to only put input into places where you can get output. And we're just bringing that same type of concept and technology to the beef industry, really. And so I appreciate what you said there, Nick. And I will say, like, this is my husband and I's first year using the identity beef test on our replacement heifers. And part of that was because I grew up from a, very involved in the seed stock side where I was taught to balance, you know, phenotype. And I had always had EPDs to look at. And I just knew what we had coming into a new operation. I really didn't know what genetics had been selected for, for bulls in previous years, for generations down the line. I really didn't know what we fully had. And so being able to have these different scores for the heifers, it's been very eye-opening for all of us on the operation to feel like we can make maybe some more sounder decisions. And maybe we were a little surprised at what some of the heifers scored, just looking at them compared to the genomic side of it. But it's uh, it's been very eye-opening and helpful. And it makes me almost more excited coming into bull sale season right now, because I feel like we can make more confident decisions about what bulls to buy. So do you want to talk a little bit about maybe more that side of it, how having this information can help you with your bull decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great from a buyer and a seller's perspective in terms of the seed stock operator. So we have a number of seed stock operators who encourage this type of testing for their commercial customers so that they can help their commercial customers make better purchasing decisions at their sales. So, you know, whether the seed stock operator is involved or not, that's what it helps you do is really characterize the strengths and weaknesses of your herd so that when you go pick out that bull in that sale, you can pick out a bull that is most complementary to your needs. I think a lot of commercial operators fall into a rut of every year we buy, maybe it's the Cabernet bull or the high growth, high marbling bull. And eventually over time, your herd develops certain strengths and weaknesses, and maybe we're not always aware of that. So what this test allows us to do is really objectively measure those strengths and weaknesses. And a lot of times we'll find, wow, I've been selecting for growth and my carcasses are great, but my stability in heifer pregnancy has maybe been suffering a little bit. So that's something I need to focus on when I go pick out my bulls. So seed stock guys like it because it makes them more of a true genetic consultant and they can really match their bulls to their customers' needs. And customers like it because they really quickly analyze those strengths and weaknesses and their needs when they're going to purchase bulls. Absolutely. So let's kind of dive into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of what exactly identity beef is. I mean, I feel like you've described it a little more, but what is it, how is it implemented and all of those great things so that listeners kind of understand how it can fit into their production system today. Yeah, identity beef gives you back a genomic score from one to 10. We tried to make it really simple. So it's not EPDs with a bunch of different numbers on different scales. It's comparable on the same scale across breeds. 10 is higher, one is lower. So we tried to make just the scale of it relatively simple. It'll give you back a score on 17 different traits. So those will include your cavities, maternal cavities, birth weight, all your growth traits like weaning, yearling, 
Average daily gain, carcass weight, also gives you back a measure of residual feed intake. So you can actually select for cattle that do more with less feed input. I think maybe most importantly, it gives you information on heifer pregnancy and cow stability. So we can help you pick those females that are more likely to get bred that first time and more likely to stay in the herd a longer time. And those are probably the biggest profit drivers, in my opinion, on a commercial cattle operation. And then, of course, it has all your carcass information, your uh, marbling, ribeye area, hot carcass weight, and even tenderness. Freezer beef and direct sales of beef is becoming a huge trend in the beef industry. And we have a lot of folks that'll do this entire test just to get that tenderness score back because they have customers that'll pay them more money for a more tender animal. And they know that they can market that animal to certain customers who will pay them more for a better eating experience. So with those scores, you know, you said from one to 10, and there's, like you said, there's 17 different traits. There's three different indexes, indices or indexes, however you want to say it, that are also in there. So from one to 10, so say a replacement heifer is like a seven for heifer pregnancy. Is that seven, is that comparing her just within your herd, your samples you sent in, or is that almost, or is that on a broader level, a little more industry-wide? What kind of constitutes that ranking? Yep. So we have a large database behind this product and we try to, every time we come out with a new version of this product, we recalibrate the average of the entire database to around 5.5. So we say 5.5 is about industry average. It may not be average of your herd. So in your herd, your whole bell curve of females may be well above average. So you'll want to make your selection and comparison decisions within your herd so that you're always selecting the best females that you have to choose from. But it also gives you an idea of how you're comparing to the rest of the industry. So you just know what your strengths and weaknesses are as a herd compared to everyone else. So it does a little bit of both. Your selection decisions are within herd, but it also gives gives you that comparative value to the rest of the industry. Awesome. So what does it look like? I mean, I know earlier you already mentioned, like a lot of times it looks like taking that TSU sample and sending that in and I've done it myself. It's a simple process, but can you walk through like, when are people usually taking the sample? Um, what's the process look like to send it to the lab, et cetera? Yep. I mean, when you take the sample, it, some people take them right at birth. You just need to be sure the cap is dry so you're not getting mom's placenta in that sample and cross-contaminating. But a lot of folks will take them at birth. They'll punch a small hole in the ear and some of them will even put that calf tag right through that same hole. Uh, typically the hole is small enough no matter what age is it's going to heal up and you're never going to have a, a full hole through their ear. So some will do it at birth. Some will do it at branding. Some will do it at weaning. My recommendation is always earlier is better. I feel that the sooner you can get an animal in the correct pipeline, and by pipeline I mean is she going to be a feeder, is she going to be a replacement heifer, the sooner you can make those decisions, the more efficient your operation is because you're not spending money developing heifers that ultimately don't become heifers, or you're putting the right amount of effort and energy into those animals sooner in life. So earlier is better. It takes about three weeks from the time we get the sample, a minimum of three weeks to get those results back. So if you know you're going to be making selection decisions, I would say at least two months ahead of that time, get your samples taken, get them into the lab. So you're certain you got that information available when you're actually making those selection and calling decisions. The nice thing about the TSU is it's really quick and easy. It works into any processing that you're currently doing. It's simple as putting in an ear tag, basically. It's all done at the head of the animal. So anytime you're running them through a chute, it's really quick and easy to just take that TSU, match that TSU number to the animal ID. They don't have to be refrigerated. You can store them for months at a time in room temperature, out of sunlight. When you ship them into the lab, they don't have to have ice with them. So there's a lot of advantages to doing the TSU route versus you know, originally we were doing pulling hair out of the tail or maybe doing blood cards. TSU is just quicker, cleaner, easier, and there's less failure rates at the lab level because there's less contamination at the ranch level. So it's really a pretty painless process. It sounds, you know, I'm taking genomics or DNA. It sounds like a really sophisticated process, but from the rancher's point of view, it's really pretty quick and easy. 
it doesn't take long at all. Okay, Nick, so you talked about 17 different traits and there are indexes as well. So can you talk about what those different indexes are and how producers can use them? Yeah, I mean, getting back a genomic score on 17 different traits on every individual animal can be kind of overwhelming. And we want to make sure that customers get real value and use out of this product. So we don't want it to be something that feels so overwhelming that it goes on the desk or it goes in the file and we don't ever do anything with it. So what we do is create indexes and we boil all those 17 traits down into single numbers. So we have a maternal index, which is obviously really helpful if you're selecting replacement females. We have a terminal index, which would be helpful if you're deciding which ones you may want to retain ownership on. You're trying to retain ownership on part of your calves, maybe not all of them, or you're just trying to add value to those calves when you market them. A higher terminal index has more value to the buyer of those calves. And we have a production index, which is kind of a balanced index of those two. So typically we boil it all down into just that maternal index if we're selecting those replacement females, but we also provide a uh, identity rank, which divides those females into four quadrants. So basically we look at their maternal index and their terminal index at the same time. If they're in the upper 50th percentile for both of those, they are called the top 25 percenters. If you think about a graph with maternal and terminal and it has an X on it, if they're in that Upper right hand corner, they're the top 25 percenters because they're the highest of both maternal and terminal. Those are females you probably want to consider keeping. If they're really high terminal but low maternal, we rank those as terminal females. You probably don't want to keep those as replacement heifers. Or if they're high maternal but low terminal, they're called maternal females, and those are the ones that you really want to keep as well. So we try to divide them into quadrants and just make it really quick and easy for our customers to interpret those results, decide these are ones I may want to keep, and then you go out into the pen and you look at them. And obviously, we have to be happy with what we're looking at when we go out in our pasture and look at our cows. But I also think we probably lean towards picking bigger, heavier females because we like the way they look. Or we've gone out there and we've said, wow, she's wide chested, she's deep ribs, she's going to make a good cow. And I'm not sure we're always correct when we make those decisions. And this helps us make those decisions a little better. I think we typically have thrown away some, not thrown away, but not retained some females that are maybe average to slightly below average weaning weight because we think, eh, I don't know, she doesn't look big and growthy. But those females make really fertile, long-lasting cows. So this can be an eye-opener, like you mentioned earlier, when it comes to looking at those animals and knowing what their genetic potential is and then making those selection and keep call decisions. I will I will say, you know, I've heard whether it's from our own, my family's own um, bull customers who have utilized this or just other people in the industry or some of my own clients through a rancher mind program who have used it. That's something that they all say is that big, beautiful, really broody looking heifer that they thought that they wanted isn't always what she looks like on paper. You know, sometimes it's, she's lacking in fertility or she's just should be more terminal. And um, so they said that was kind of always I've heard that's kind of always the hardest part about the first year of using it. Yeah. When you look at the correlations between the traits, high growth and stability are very negatively correlated. So the more growth we select for, the shorter they last in our cow herd. And I think that makes sense in most people's minds, but it's hard to make sense of that when you're looking at these females and picking them out. What are some other kind of first year hiccups or maybe missed opportunities or challenges or mistakes that people make those first couple of years where they implement this process? I think one of them is just realizing that it takes patience. Anything in the cattle industry takes a lot of time. A generation interval is about five years in the cattle industry. So we'll have folks who will test one year and next year they expect to see a result in their calf crop. Well, the animals that they chose to select and keep on that test haven't had calves yet. So it's 
it's a multi-year process. It's not something that you can jump in and out of and say, oh, I'm going to try it and see what happens. It's really a multi-year process to make continual improvement over time. So I just think setting that expectation from the beginning is really important to know that like everything in the cattle industry, it takes a lot of time before those heifers that you're actually selecting start having calves and you see the progress and the change in your herd. So be patient, but know that the science works, the product works, and over time, you're gonna be able to make multi-trait genetic improvement and move multiple traits in the right direction. Absolutely. All right, Nick. Well, as we kind of wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with those listening? Um, just really encourage people to at least look into it. You can go to neogen.com, which I, you're going to realize once you get on there, it's a large corporate website. And Neogen does a lot of stuff that you probably didn't know Neogen does. We're not just a genomic company, but you can migrate to the genomics tabs. You can get to just the beef industry tab and really get into those products and do some learning on what all we offer and what we do. Um, you can also, if you're into email, just email DNA help at neogen.com and say, hey, I want to talk to a human being, and we'll get the right territory rep in your area to give you a call and potentially get out to your place and uh, have a conversation with you and just see if it's something that may be right for you and your operation. Absolutely. Well, Nick, thank you again for being on the show today. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate you having me. Alrighty, folks, that is a wrap on that one. I want to say a big thank you <clears throat> Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on that one. I want to say a big thank you to Nick for joining me for this conversation. I know we've talked about the topic before on the show, but I really do think it is very important. As you heard in the episode, it's something that even my husband and I are jumping into and trying on our commercial cattle. And so with that, really, I just encourage you to, at a minimum, take a look at this program. And so I put a link to Neogen's website in the show notes that should take you directly to their beef page, hopefully. Um, that way you don't um, aren't overwhelmed by a lot of the other options, like Nick said, sometimes when you just go to the regular website. But with that, thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to contact me through the website or Facebook. Um, or like Nick said, reach out to them um, on their website. With that, have a great day. And... That's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.